Hey guys, today we are lucky to have Mr. Nicholas Winding Refn in office to talk about his new Amazon series, Too Old to Die Young, wonderful title by the way, Instant Hook. Um, we got to see, just so they know where I'm coming from, we got to see episodes four and five, which is what you showed at Can. And um, I overheard you talking to Steve outside a little bit to, to sort of perceive it like, like the younger generation where we could drop in at episode four and five, see if we like it, start it from the beginning, kind of roll with it that way. Was there, aside from that, did you just feel like these two episodes together had a sort of filmic story you could take to a film festival and give to critics? Well, yes, because the whole uh, movie, you know, I would do movies. So I decided to make a long movie uh, on streaming. Um, and then I would chop it up in different rhythms, meaning that episodes would be different lengths, just like a book. I thought, well, it's 13 hours long, so just showing episode one is not really an introduction <laughs> to the world. And I thought, when, when you go buy books, you know, you take them down from the shelf when you browse through it, you very rarely read the first page, you go into the middle and assess, and then you decide if you want to buy it or not. Mm. So I thought, well, let me show the heart of the show. So I went straight to the middle. And that means that after the two hours that you have seen, there's still 11 hours to go mm -hmm. on both ends of the spectrum. So to me, that was just a more kind of uh, authentic way to present to you the world of by NWR through Too Old to Die Young. And um, at the same time, it was a great puzzlement, which of <laughs> course is always fun to talk about because everyone always searches for an answer. Yes, of course. I find it particularly intriguing because, kind of contrary to that, didn't you guys actually film in chronological order? I shoot everything I do in chronologically order. So um, it was like one giant canvas, like one operatic scenario of just painting every day. But you guys, you guys filmed for an incredibly long time, right? I shot for 10 months. Yeah, that's, that is a long shoot. So. Every day. <laughs> How does, I mean, is there a difference between doing a, filming something chronologically for, you know, a few weeks to a few months to then 10 months, almost a whole year of taking a story from front to back? Absolutely, because when I do my films, they have roughly between five to six weeks shooting schedules, which, you know, is a little more adaptable, you know, to kind of sanely yeah. get through. But for 10 months, you know, you go a little cuckoo once in a while, and then you still wake up, and it's the same thing. It's a bit like being in Groundhog, you know, it's like, what was that movie where he reads up and the same song begins again? Like yeah. after like six months, you go to set and you're like, whoa, I was just here a month ago. And, um, you know, you get a little t disoriented. But at the same time, it's incredibly intoxicating because you're just working. You're painting every day. Yeah. And that's when you're alive. So it was also incredibly thrilling. How do you, when you're at that point where you're going a little cuckoo and you're like, let's say month seven and it's, it's a lot, how do you make yourself get up the next day and go through the next Groundhog Day? Well, TV, like everything in, in, in cinema and so forth, is very also practically driven. You just have to get up. Yeah. Um, it was hardest probably on my family because mm -hmm. I wasn't around a lot and that, of course, is a huge guilt trip so there was a lot of pain in that at the same time you know the, the idea that you wake up and it's like this the disoriented was almost became part of the creative process mm -hmm. like you lose yourself in this world because of chronologically I could decide every day how it would evolve and it was going through your self-analysis completely and utterly it's like it was like therapy for 10 months <laughs> that's well that also sounds intense uh i'm curious so you you co-wrote this with ed brubaker who is of course a legendary comic writer and did some writing on westworld and it's just a brilliant writer 
But I'm curious why his, his tone, his style was something you wanted to be a part of this world. Well, I, I had been friends with Ed, you know, prior, and I had hired him on a, another project that I own called Maniac Cop that he's written the script for, and it's now being developed to f for serial opportunities. And I loved working with Ed on Maniac Cop, and so when I had the idea for Too Old to Die Young, knowing the, the, the giant beast it would become, I thought it was a great way for us to do some things where I would even direct it. And then uh, we started working on it. And of course, his, his story sensibilities, his natural ideas of how to come up with interesting narratives and characters, we were a great match, he and I. But we were missing a link, and I went to Alejandro Jodorowsky in Paris to have a tarot reading on what I needed to do, and the, of course, it became very clear what we needed was a woman. Mm -hmm. So uh, I brought in a writer called Halle Gross, who Ed had worked with on other projects. So they were very, very friendly, very, very close friends. So it was a very natural inclusion into the family. So we became like a trio. And that's really when the writing became truly what the show was. Mm. When we were all there together, there was, as we say, the yin and the yang. There was a man and a woman, and we were equally partners and equally creative. And it was just, I've never laughed so much mm. for so long. Wow, that's funny for this series, which is a dark sense of humor, but is certainly uh, not a laugh riot, I would say. Uh, I find it very funny. It's, it's funny. <laughs> But it's also dark, as, as your material is known to be. But it's very funny. Yes. <laughs> it's very campy. It is that. You're correct. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm excited to see more some of the dark humor, and it really does hit, hit my particular sense of humor. When you guys are writing together in a trio, and I believe you also worked with two other writers on The Neon Demon, how do you like to write as a part of a group? Do you sit in a room and work together? Do you bounce back versions of the script, uh, take it from here, and then someone else takes it from there? Uh, well, it kind of depends. Um, sometimes I would write the story or the clear narrative, the kind of concept. Uh, sometimes I have an idea, then I work with someone else to kind of figure out what it could become. Sometimes I do it alone and just sit in a room and do everything myself. Um, regarding the Neon Demon, I wanted to work with, um, I wanted to have as many women around me as possible. So of course the writing process was part of that. And I was very intrigued by how we could clash and something interesting would come out of it. And it also put you out of your comfort zone when you're challenged. Yeah. Uh, you know, we had a great female DP on, on uh, the Neon Demon, a great female cast. It was like that was the, the goal, was to unlock the 17-year-old girl within me. <laughs> and uh, everyone has them. Yes. And so with Too Old to Die Young, it was, became at one point also very mechanical because we had to produce so much stuff. Sure. So we were writing before I started shooting, but we were also writing when I was shooting because I would keep on changing. Nice. And in the end, it really just became me sitting across them here and then basically dictating what, what we had to do and what we had to kind of, f where the story was going in my mind. And then we would come up with ideas together or scenes together or we would rewrite scripts that hadn't been produced yet or sometimes I would go in and I would change the whole script of an episode we were actually shooting. So suddenly at you know, 10 p.m. we were working until 2 a.m. and I had to get up at 6 a.m. to go shoot and then mm. I would still keep on changing it on set. So the evol th that creative high is really what you become a junkie to. But then you also have to get very matter of factly where you would say I work with this, with that, I'll work with that, with Hallie. Practically we've got to get this, this and this and this done and then you move on and move on. But the trio functioned because we were a trio. Mm. Yeah. Is that room for evolution part of why you like uh, shooting chronologically so that you can change the story as you go? Yes, I believe for me, I always say the product is what's called dead space. It's the process where you're alive. Mm. It's the process. The act of creativity is more important than the product. 
the act of, because that's, that's where you live. The product, when it's produced, is just sitting there. You know, whatever you end up doing, if you're a musician or a painter or a poet or a writer or a filmmaker or whatever, clay installation, art installation, it, it, the product is an, is an extension of you, at least in my case, but the process of making is when you're alive. Mm. And I don't like knowing. I like to be, to, to, to have the ability to be based all my decision on how do I feel. Mm -hmm. So how does that, um, how does that translate to the way you work with actors? I mean, that's, that's probably an interesting creative challenge for them as well to have to not necessarily improv, but evolve in that way as it goes. You're going to have to ask them, but I mean, everyone that I work with, and I've been very fortunate to work with some magnificent yes. actors and actresses, um, they all seem to really uh, indulge themselves in the process because from a performance point of view, you're no longer having to mechanically create everything. You can just go with the flow. Mm. It's also scary because now there's no right or wrong. You know, you, it's, it's also a form of dedication because you can't really be thinking about other things while you're saying your lines because it will be revealed if you're not 100% focused. Yeah. Well, you've got a very intense leading actor here, as you often do. And I'm curious, how did Miles Teller become the guy for this? Was, it, was he who you had in mind? Did you read a lot of people for it and he was the best? What was the journey to getting there? Well, the Miles Teller character Martin, who kind of is the star of the show, um, I never got as far as reading anyone because very early on I... Um, I met with Miles. I think he was the first actor that I actually really met with about the part. And um, <clears throat> face to face. And I remember even calling Elle Fanning, going, what do you think? Who do you, who do you think I should cast? <laughs> you know, and getting her take on it. And then she was like, you know, Miles Teller. And um, so I met with Miles and um, we had a great, interesting conversation and Miles has a very funny way of explaining it you know about how we just stared at each other for a very long time speaking very very slowly but in my mind I was just thinking I can't believe I'm looking at Elvis Presley <laughs> and if I can make <clears throat> this beast of a project starring Elvis Presley, the actual reincarnation, because he looks so much like him. Yeah. And my wife said he walks like John Travolta from, you know, uh, Saturday Night Fever, and he stands like John Wayne. I was like, the iconography of that, because you know, Miles is one of the best actors around, so yeah. it wasn't the craftsmanship that you're even debating. You're, you, it's more like a sensibility Mm -hmm. It's the last 10% of do you and I have something in common that's going to make this interesting. And I was just right away and I asked if he would wanted to do it and he said sure and then that was that. Wow. Did, there was no reluctance about a 10 month commitment? I think for him it was more even an excitement because you know in independent films you get so little time yeah. to do anything. So at least here uh, we had more time. Yeah, it's more of a theater actor sort of. Yeah, it's like it's like going on stage. In. Yeah, you get to. I mean, that's a long time to spend with a character. Um, so, it was obviously a huge deal that you got to premiere this at Cannes, being the status of streaming there and everything. And you, when you were there at your press conference, spoke pretty vocally about your support of streaming mm -hmm. and your belief in it. And I'm curious why is it why is it so something that you're so passionate about and something that was the necessary sort of medium for this project well first of all you can say the you cannot make a 13-hour movie in the normal theatrical yeah. world when you look at <clears throat> the origin of film in a way there's a sense of a deja vu because back then you had the great inventors of film were making 
eight hour movies, six hour movies, it, 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 because it was, a, it was an undiscovered canvas. There was no rules in the game and you would play at 5,000 seat stadiums where people would go and watch this invention called film that became mass media. And to me, streaming is kind of the equivalent of that because streaming is part of the digital revolution where there's a flow around us that we tap in and out of. You know, what's going away is traditional television. I mean, that's, that is a nor doornail to me at least, mm. and also certainly my children never watch television. Why should they, right. you know? So our viewing habits, our communication habits, the way that we vote, the way that we interact with each other, the way that we live our lives has changed so much with streaming and the digital revolution. So I thought when, when, um, when I was approached about doing this or when Amazon came to me and asking what I wanted to do after Nia and Demon, I was like, I want to do a really long movie. And you can do that in streaming. So that opportunity is just really interesting because it's where my kids exist. Mm. You know, I have, my eldest is 16. This is her world. This is her language. This is her canvas. And rather than trying to bring her world into what I used to know, I want to go into what they do, what, how they communicate, how they interact, what they see, because they're so smart. They're so clever, they're so, they're so quick to say, I don't feel it. And I think that's beautiful because it goes back to the point that creativity is about sincerity, it's about a point of view, it's about inspiration. You know, we live in a world that's so obsessed with good or bad or, uh, uh, you know, being comfortable that we forget that art's purpose is to challenge our comfortability to make us think to change the world and I think because of the revolution that has become more and more clear because you know there's no point in producing content if it doesn't become something of a catharsis for you because from an audience including myself time is precious and if I'm to give my time away to something, what do I get in return? And entertainment, God, it's all for free online. My telephone gives me free entertainment. Yeah. So I need, to be, I need to be thrilled, I need to be seduced. So the idea that art has reverted back to this point of view, it's far more of a higher commodity, it's much more important. And streaming allows that because it's a flow of energy we just tap into and tap out of wherever we are, mm. just like what I make is designed for the telephone or for the Lumiere cinema and can. There's no, they can't be one or the other. It, it has to work on all different avenues. That's a very interesting perspective because, you know, there's a lot of debate about theatrical versus streaming and what the film experience is meant to be. And I, I think you've tapped into something really powerful and cool that I love about streaming, which is the, the intimacy and immediacy of mm -hmm. it and bringing your art into someone's home instead of asking them to go to you. I think that's a, a powerful move, especially for an ambitious project like this that asks an audience to really pay attention. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I still love the cinema. I mean, I love yeah. going to the cinema. We had a fantastic premiere at the Vista here. It was very romantic. It was a beautiful design, you know, cathedral of dreams, and we projected in that, and that was also a perfect way. But it's also equally as perfect as watching on your iPhone with your headset somewhere in the forest. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the exposure or the, the, the creativity itself should not be determined on how you view it. It can, it can, it can be pros and cons. It is about you and the interaction and how you want to be interacted. And if you want to go to the cinema to see things, I love it. I love the cinema. But the reality is, is that streaming is the final finale of everything we do. Yeah. So you also have to look at that with all the opportunities that provides you. I'm not saying one is better than the other. It's, that's an individual thing. It's like, who do you want to have sex with? I don't know. 
whatever makes you happy. Lots of good options, just whatever makes you happy. Yeah, I mean, and you're, you're absolutely right. Everything's going to end up on streaming in the end anyway. So that is a very wise tactic. Uh, I'm curious your thoughts on, because you refer to this as a 13-hour film, that is the sort of idea of a TV series versus a long film is something that TV critics definitely have a lot of very intense debates about. So I, I'm wondering what your definition is that makes it a film. Is it, is it simply structural things like no commercial breaks, stuff like that? Or what, what does that mean to you when you say 13-hour film? Well, I decided to make a Nick Reffin movie just really, really long. <laughs> so that, to me, is a long movie. Yeah. And, of course, I didn't use the systematic uh, three-act structure, episodic storytelling that dominates the general market because that's what people know. So you make what you know, you react to what you know. I don't have an interest in that because I don't watch it. I don't, to me, it's like, it's like an, it's like it suffers in a way the same way that a lot of cinema suffers is that it's predictable. It's, it's pre-manufactured, it's pre-sought out. So many, so many twists you can throw in in the same constructions. And if you, if you wash away all that, all you really have is just emotions. And you have an, a, 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 like a liquid, it's like a flow of emotion that just comes out. And I decided to take all the tricks of the trade away of what is serialized, conventional television and say, I don't have an interest in that. I'm just going to use the platform to just expand everything I do into 13 hours. So now it's the future. And that, to me, is far more interesting. Yeah, I watched an interview with you where you said you are from the future. Do you feel that you are catching up with yourself with the show in that context? Like you're finally seeing your, your opportunities match where your brain was at? Yes. And now I can rethink what the next future will be like. Ah, even more intriguing. Do you have any theories? Yes. Will you share them? Soon. Okay, fair enough. Very coy. Mm. Uh, but I come in peace. That's good. Thank goodness. We need a little peace. Uh, if you said that this is sort of a, you just wanted to make a longer Nicholas Winning Refn film, what did you learn about the, like yourself as a filmmaker, the way you want to tell stories in the process of doing that? Did you discover new elements that you hadn't necessarily seen in the shorter format or new avenues you want to pursue in the future? I'm not, I'm not an analyst like that, mm. you know, just like I'm not a politician. I'm not here to, I'm not asking for your vote. <laughs> I can only create what I create mm -hmm. the way I want to do it. That's what I can offer. And, and, and so from that perspective, I don't, I don't think about it. So you didn't, yeah. It's, uh, we got a little visitor here, but if you, you didn't find that in having time to tell your story in a different way that you found you liked telling it a certain way, it just, it felt the same? Just the same thing. That's so cool. I wouldn't expect that. Uh, you always have to look in the world of creativity as you don't conform to it it conforms to you. Hmm. So like if you were, I guess I, I, I'm perceiving what you mean. All my life I've been told what I should do and how to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? And um, you know, polarization is the true definition of success. I mean, maybe not financial success, <laughs> but not everything is based on money. Yeah. You know, we, we unfortunately spend a lot of time valuing creativity at the moment on dollar signs, thinking dollar signs equals quality. That's not, it's like the same, does that mean that the most successful restaurant chains are the best food? We all know that's not true. Right. So why do we comply that in entertainment the same way? Of course, the business of entertainment you need to know to exist, but there are dollar and cents of ways to do things that actually make things that are the most specifically unique niche material to be financially upside. Mm -hmm. But the idea of polarization is that 
It's when you have something to argue about. It's what creates the dialogue. If you like something and someone else hates it, then you and that person have an interaction. And art is 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 is, of, is, is our hearts. It's our emotions. It's how we communicate. Art ex art expands our horizon. Art moves human beings forward. You know, art is the only element of the human mind that the AI cannot create. It can duplicate it, but it can't create it. Mm. It can do everything else we can do with our hands, with our analysts and so forth, but it cannot create because it doesn't have a soul. And soul is the foundation of a point of view. It's the flow of your emotions. This is what I see, this is how I feel. So all my life I've always been told especially by the quote-unquote establishment, you know, the enemy of creativity, good <laughs> taste, of all the things I'm doing wrong. And it's the same thing they say. And sometimes I always wonder, do they actually think that one day I'm going to listen? <laughs> or is it more like maybe they're just wrong mm. and I'm right? Because my mother always said I was a genius. So that's what I'm working out of. And Good if job, people Mom. don't agree with that, that's fine. Yeah. I don't, that's cool. And, but it's not going to change the fact that it's 100% me. And that's what I can offer you. That's the only thing I can entertain you with. I am in the end of the day a showman. I am an entertainer. But I can only entertain you with what I am. Mm -hmm. I love it. I think that you are very successful in your mission because m many of the better conversations or debates I have about movies tend to be about your film, specifically The Neon Demon, which I freaking love and has, as you're well aware, some strong reactions. Thank you. Uh, so that's, that's definitely, you are good at creating conversations and uh, films that, that strike people in a strong way. Mm -hmm. uh, when you come off of making your 13-hour film, working in streaming, working with Amazon, does it make you hungry to do more in that avenue? Are you now like, I got, I got to go make a five-week film? Where is your head at? Uh, well, I want to make a movie next yeah. just to do something different. But I have hundreds of ideas floating around that I would like to just you know, go into. Yeah. But everything I do, I've kind of been able to now focus on which is, you know, my own streaming site by NWR. Mm -hmm. That has become now the kind of the mountain of, of my intentions, that everything I now create is to build out of that. Whatever it is, I'm not sure yet, mm. but that is the next future for me. Gotcha. It's a very, that site has a really cool layout. It's an uh, impressive design. And it's also, I mean, you aren't, like, you've been embracing streaming for a minute now. It's not just this show. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you have, because you are one of those filmmakers, as many are, who when you go look at the news stories, there are many projects over the years that you have been attached to, detached, still might be happening. I was happy to hear Maniac Cop is still a possibility. Oh, yeah. uh, do you have ones that are, like, didn't happen, but keep you up at night still or do you tend to move on to new ideas when they don't follow through? Well, I've never had anything fall through. Um, um, regarding Mini Cop, it's an IP I own, so that will always be when it's ready mm -hmm. and the right way, then it'll be get made. I just don't want to get made to make it. You know, right. that's not <laughs> worth people's time or the people making it. It needs to be there for a reason. It needs to be made with the passion. But since I have the IP, it's just it's just standing on a on a hangar in a beautiful plane, just getting ready to take off. It's full of gasoline, and now I just need the last pieces to make sure that it's the right takeoff. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding everything else, um, no, I mean um, projects that have come to me or that I've been approached about, I've always decided not to do them in the end. You know, I I, uh, I, uh, I love Hollywood. I love glamour. I love glitz. I love camp. I love vanity. I, I love egos. I indulge in all that. Um, 
but the the bigger kind of approaches or the offers that has come my way or the interest in the end I've always just felt that I wasn't the right person in the end for it. It doesn't mean that it won't happen. I mean, I, I would love to do one of those comic book. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, me and Batgirl, it's like we coexist. Yeah. Um, That's right. You found your inner teenage girl. So, you know, um, you know, it's, it's just like a lot of people obsessed with this idea if this is it or this is it. I said, if it comes and it's the right and I can do my version of it or I can be part of a contribution to that, great. But if it's not, I'll just go make something else. Yeah. That makes sense. I know certainly everything you've just said about what you value in art, I could see how those conversations would be difficult. I'm hoping that since Warner Brothers is leaning a little weird with their comic books, that maybe Bat Girl, maybe we'll see that one day. Um, I know who's going to play it. Oh, really? I'm sure you wouldn't tell me, but maybe off camera. Uh, I have to let you go. It's been so much fun talking with you. Thank you for coming in, and congratulations on your series and or 13-hour film. Thank you very much.